Uh, very good evening uh, to our viewers. Thank you for joining us tonight on uh, the agenda. My name is uh, Toivo Njabela. Tonight uh, on the platform we are joined by Evilastus Karonda. He is president of the oldest political party in the country, Swanu. Thank you, uh, Eva, Evilastus. <laughs> People always confuse yeah, it to yeah, the name. Yeah, yeah. But it's, uh, it's such a pleasure to have you on the platform. It's an important year. It's 2024. But before we get into anything, the first, the last time we engaged on a platform like this, you were representing uh, NANLO, the labor union. Are you still uh, involved in the union? Does it ex exist, as a matter of fact? I, 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 I know it exists, <laughs> but I'm no longer in involved. Okay. I'm on uh, sabbatical. You're on the sabbatical? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, but that was always your, your space. That, that is where you excelled. That is how we all got to know Karonda. So what transpired there? Well, look, I thought I would uh, make a transition to, into the political you know, realm mm -hmm. with the hope of uh, carrying on the worker struggle, but within the political you know, space. Yeah. We have had uh, a lot of um, difficulties uh, getting what we thought the workers you know, deserved legislatively, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you would recall um, 2015, 16, the unlawful strike of the fishermen or the seagoing employees mm -hmm. um, came as a, as a result, among other, other, other factors, of the fact that the Labor Act uh, did not cover the specificities of work um, um, at sea. Mm -hmm. So we needed to push government to ratify ILO Convention, I think, 188, yeah. that deals with work at sea. Um, that was only ratified in 2018 and started being implemented as from you know, 2019. Mm. Now, I believe that if we had trade union leaders also um, involved within the political space, a lot of these things would have been done quite earlier and the yeah. strike would have been averted. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the motivations that I thought a transition would actually help you know, in the long run. Yeah. <coughs> the, that issue persists. The issue of uh, fishermen persists. Um, did you abandon the ship? Did you leave them to their own devices? No, I think, I think as, as a union we did what we could do. Um, you remember we went to court um, um, because the strike was unlawful, naturally, we, we lost the case. Um, but that was the end of, 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 the, of the legal you know, uh, road that, that anybody could have taken. Now what remains to be done, I think, <coughs> was um, you know, for the trade unions that are involved to fight for um, these um, employees to at least get you know gainful employment mm -hmm. um, and, and peg that on to the the quota system or the quotas that you know government would allocate to the various you know fishing companies mm -hmm. um, so I thought that would happen because before I left uh, we had done uh, you know similar things where workers were taken back um, negotiated with government to give those companies you know favorable consideration when it comes to the fishing quota and so on allocation. Mm. Uh, that, that was done, but I'm, I'm sure um, not everybody was, uh, you know, absorbed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but that remains, you know, uh, the work of those that are involved there to continue. Yeah. Abs absolutely. <coughs> In your assessment, um, what is the root cause of that situation? It's, it's a sad situation. Uh, people have been uh, on the streets. Some of them have camped at a particular area in Valves Bay for a long time. Uh, but despite what might be the arguments right now, the genesis of this whole thing, in your, in your, in your understanding as, as, as someone who was very much involved, what, what, what do you recall? Look, I think the workers were simply just robbed in yeah. broad daylight. Mm. The Labor Act 
would provide that um, a working day would consist of um, a maximum nine hours, right? Um, added to that would be a maximum of three hours of yeah. overtime. Mm. Now, if you are at sea and you have netted fish, most of those employees would have worked a minimum of 19 hours, mm. 19 hours a day without rest. And that's why there were a lot of um, accidents um, a lot of um, our members had um, lost limbs, some died, um, and the overtime that was worked was never paid, was mm -hmm. never compensated. Mm -hmm. And that is what fueled um, the, 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 the frustration and eventually the, the unlawful you know, strike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is the genesis of it. And, and that's when, of course, some of us, upon closer scrutiny, realized that the Labor Act was just simply inadequate. Yeah, yeah. And the government needed to ratify and domesticate, you know, the ILO Convention 188, and, and subsequently, of course, that was done. But that was only done in 19, you know, in 2018. Mm -hmm. You see, so the struggles we are talking about are struggles that, you know, precede 2018. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, just lastly, on the subject of uh, fishermen, fish rot happened. Um, there were also a lot of labor consequences there. Uh, people, some companies having been, uh, having lost their quarters so that they can be given to fish core, which was a, used as a conduit, apparently, for, for, for fish rot. And these companies who lost uh, uh, fishing quarters had to get rid of people. What has been your general attitude towards uh, fish rot? You see, let me take you back again to the strike. During the course of that, a lot of the fishermen came to Vinduk. And the idea was to meet President Hage, the late president. Um, and I remember thousands of these fishermen being kept at the roadblock, police not wanting them to come through until they could speak to me. So when I went to talk to the police at the roadblock, we then agreed that we would bring them in and they would give us a, you know, a place at, uh, uh, where they go and buy every Friday, uh, uh, the parkies? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's where we went to, 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 to house the, you know, uh, the fishermen when they came in. A day after that, we, we met the president. Now, what I found, you know, out of place, <laughs> see, this was a labor matter. Okay, uh, so I would have understood if we met the Labour Minister and perhaps the Minister of Fisheries. Mm. But uh, we went to State House, I think we met probably the entire cabinet. And um, we had our say, and we had hoped that the President would come to the rescue of, of these employees. Um, and the day that followed our meeting at State House, we then had a meeting with uh, the Minister of Labor, the Ministry of Labor. I think at that time it was, you know, uh, uh, Erki Nimtina. Mm. And when we entered the boardroom, uh, who did we meet? We met uh, Esau, there was Erki, and there was Saki Shangala. Now, Saki had nothing to do with uh, <laughs> what was going on mm. with his employees. I don't think he had anything to do with labor. Um, and, and Saki, unfortunately, um, you know, he took over the meeting and uh, there was no solution found. So, yes, my take on, 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 on Fish Road um, is one that, one, it was an orchestrated thing by, you know, the political elites. Um, it was intended to uh, in, enrich them. And I think um, it's only unfortunate that perhaps it, the, the eggs fell on um, or is bound to fall on, you know, Saki, uh, Atikulipi, and Nesau. But I think um, cabinet was, 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 was aware of what was going on. Um, I think uh, our late president was very, very aware. And that's why he had, uh, you know, delegated or sent a person like Saki Shangala to a meeting that had nothing to do with his department or portfolio. Mm -hmm. So um, it's an unfortunate, I think, chapter 
in, in, in the life of, of, of most of, of, of these fishermen, as well as the country. A lot of our people lost their lives. They committed suicide, mm. you know, uh, because of what happened. And mind you, one of the companies that we struggled with, um, that Point Blanc refused to even negotiate the return of workers, was Seaflower. You know, Seaflower, a subsidiary of, of Fishcore, mm. um, headed by Mike Ipunwa. So yes, um, fish rod had a serious impact. Hmm. On, on the lives of these, of, these, of these fishermen. And it is unfortunate that to this very day, there hasn't been found any genuine solution. What, what should be the consequences for anyone who will be found to have orchestrated that? To be honest, um, I, I wish we, we had the Chinese <laughs> regime. When you, you see, when you steal from the public, you don't only betray the trust that people have placed in you, but you also take away opportunities that could have benefited a lot of our people. Um, so they must, in my view, if found guilty, be given the, mo you know, the maximum punishment. But that alone does not begin to address the plight of these fishermen that, that we keep talking about. And I think they deserve to be taken in, they deserve to be absorbed into, into the employment opportunities that are there. Mm -hmm. But, you see, I would go on further and say that the situation where workers or fishermen in this specific case remain salary earners and um, just employees, I think is also a key reason why a lot of these things do not or a lot of our people do not benefit from the natural resources that we have. Yeah. Now, why not create a situation where these very same employees can also become shareholders of these very same companies and protect these companies from, from, from collapse, from thieves, you know, from these corrupt you know, individuals, yeah. because they would know that protecting these you know, companies would mean protecting their very own bread. But you can't protect this bread unless you have a say, mm. unless you are at the table. And I think being an employee alone, um, in my view, uh, uh, emasculates yeah. these very same you know, employees. But when you bring them to the table, you empower them, they become uh, part owners of, of these companies, they become involved in the decisions that are made. Mm. Um, and so nothing in my view would go wrong when you begin to involve these workers as, 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 as key stakeholders. Mm -hmm and not just employees or salary earners. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> Your former political home, Swapo, is uh, being heavily linked to fish rot. Uh, there are testimonies by people like uh, Magni Punya, who blatantly says in court papers that uh, money was channeled from uh, fish corps to swap ahead of the 2017 Congress under the guise of uh, government objectives, but the money went into there. Uh, Swapo denies ever benefiting from fish rot. Uh, Mr. Paulus Nawa of uh, ACC found Swapo not guilty of any involvement in that. Uh, is it a cock and bull story? Look, I don't know what people expect from Paulus Nawa really. Um, but what do you expect him to say to absolve <laughs> Swapo? That, that that's 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 his, uh, I think, uh, area of, uh, of of expertise. I think he has he has he has time and again proven to be a very ineffective um, uh, corruption, you know, <laughs> fighter. Um, he has proven to be good when it comes to protecting his own interest and, by extension. Um, the interest of those that uh, he serves. He, he doesn't serve the public. He serves Swapo, he serves um, himself. And I think it's most unfortunate, and, and unfortunately, um, in Swapo, there are two things that, that happen. When you eat, um, you become the closest and, and best of friends of those that are in charge. Um, uh, but you eat, don't complain when you eat, and, and don't, don't, don't threaten to expose those that you eat together with. Mm. Otherwise, you know, you will end up like uh, some others who have even lost their lives. The second, of course, is that uh, you must always 
play the fool. Then, uh, then you survive. You go very high, mm. very, very far. But the moment you begin to question things, um, that's when you become a target. They would ostracize you. Yeah, you yeah. So I, I, I don't expect anything good to come from Noah. Um, it is clear that Swabo benefited, and I think um, a lot of um, you know the comrades within uh, Swapo have also confirmed that uh, what they saw during the elections and, and the time prior to Congress and so on, it, it was it was something that even they couldn't under, you know ex explain because the money that that was uh, changing hands, money some comrades had money in, in boots of their cars and so on, uh, paying uh, uh, making payments and so on and so forth. Look, I don't think there's anything um, that. Uh, uh, is out of place as far as you know Noah's findings are concerned. That's his usual. Um, he couldn't find anything wrong with people uh, that 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 we thought had done you know wrong things. Um, so it's, it's not surprising in that sense. Mm, yeah, yes. yeah. You before you joined uh, Swan, you were of course a Swapo member. Uh, but actively, of course, you were a unionist. And uh, it looks like it was your union work that has uh, stepped on toes of many leaders in Swapo. But let me not put words in your mouth. What drove you out of the party? Well, look, the Swapo that I joined the liberation movement that I thought it was, and the swapo that I got to experience um, were two different things. I, I came to learn that swapo was not genuinely committed to the freedom of the black people in this country. Um, and that's why, and I think the evidence speaks for itself. Uh, if, if you ask yourself who in this country lives in areas that are referred to as informal settlements, you wouldn't see a white person living in any informal settlement in the country. Who in this country lives in areas referred to as subsistence agricultural areas? No white person, all of them black. Poverty unemployment afflicts the very same people. It, it has taken a strong racial dimension affecting black people of this country. Now, if Swapo was committed to the cause of our people, I'm sure it could have done more. Um, it, it could have done more to liberate or to free our people from poverty. It hasn't done that. Unemployment afflicts the same people. Right? And unemployment has always been a, a double digit. Um, uh, but, but Swapo's government wants us to believe that the biggest macroeconomic problem that we have to date is inflation. Right? And that's why they are fixated with inflation targeting. That's why you will always hear that the you know, central bank has increased the repo rate. What, what does that do if you increase the repo rate? You make the cost of borrowing just too high. Money becomes expensive. Now, if money becomes expensive and you have a company, that means you need to tap into your own um, reserves, into your own savings, to be able to expand business. You can borrow because it's expensive. And the, the, the other side to it is that you would also need to lay off workers. You, you cannot employ people, you see. Yeah. Now, those are the macroeconomic strategies that we have seen the Swabo government pursue. But all of these things have failed time and again. They have failed here, they have failed everywhere else in the world, you see. We, we are told that um, uh, having our <laughs> dollar pegged to the rent is the safest thing we can, I mean seriously, how can that be safe when that only, to me it means we have lazy leaders, leaders who simply feel that they have created a comfort zone for themselves and they want to live in that comfort zone and they want to manage this thing the way it is and do not have any interest in, in taking risks and developing the country. Mm -hmm. 
So mm. we would remain financially or you know, economically a, a province of South Africa yeah. for as long as we shall live. And our people would never be able uh, to experience the kind of economic freedom that, 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 that anybody must experience in their lifetime. But what is, the, any, what is the, the harm in being pegged to the rent? I mean, uh, we are in the same uh, monetary area. Uh, it saves us trouble of exchange rates and all these things. Uh, they are a stronger economy and they are fighting. Their, their currency is fighting strongly against global currencies like the US dollars and whatnot. And we climb on their back under those circumstances. How much can why, it why be? Why do we need to ride on anybody's back? When do we when do we stand on our own? Because it's a tiny economy. Ours is a very tiny economy. We'll, well climb. Yeah. people will tell you that Botswana is a tiny economy. I don't see Botswana struggling. It's about planning. It's about being serious with what you have to do. Botswana, in as far as I'm concerned, even look at the deal that Botswana has with with, with the beer. It's a hundred times better than the deal Namibia has with, <laughs> with the beer. Why? It's about commitment. It's about competency. It's about seriousness. You see, so you have people whose interests or priorities are simply just misplaced. When you're supposed to be negotiating deals with the beer, what most of our leaders think about is what they can get as individuals out of the deals. And that's why they sell us all out. You know? So I feel that there must come a time when Namibia says, we, we, we are fine, let us struggle, but at least we are struggling on our own, mm. you know? Engage other countries as equals, not as beggars, yeah. you know? You can't be riding on South Africa forever and still want to convince the rest of the world that you're a serious player. You know? I, hear, I hear you. Look at the money that we have generated, that we generate in a country. We are said to be probably, if not the second, probably the third um, highest net capital exporter. Now, if you export money, and most of our money, by the way, <laughs> goes to South Africa. Mm -hmm. Now, if we are a net capital exporter, why is it that you have presidents going around the world inviting people from other countries to come and invest in our country when we have the money, but we export the money to South Africa. What kind of madness is that? If you, if you have money, why don't you go out in the world and look for skills? Skills can be bought, mm. you know? But set your own agenda, your own industrial agenda, invite people to fit that agenda who have skills that are in sync with what you want to do. But to go out in the world and look for people to come and invest their money here, would not help us. And I think Ramatex is a classical example of that. The fact that Ramatex today is dead, but Agoa still provides an opportunity for us, a market, it tells you that the government has never been serious about anybody else other than those who lead it. Yeah. You have a market, in other words, you have off-takers in America through Agoa, right? Now, if you have the infrastructure here that we have built for Ramatex, <laughs> Are you telling me that you can't find skills from, from outside of this country to bring here and help our own people also gain the very same skills and feed the American market? I mean, seriously. I hear you. Yes. Before we go for a small break, uh, Mr. Karonda, I just want to ask you one last question on, on your association with SWAPO. Um, the culture or well, the trend, the trend rather that I've, that I've observed for so many years is that Swapo becomes this ugly animal only when people like you have landed in a particular space, troubled space. In your case, you were with NUNW, it's a union affiliated to Swapo. You, of course, like I said earlier, you stepped on many toes. I thought it was a, it was a, it was a, a noble fight, but you angered uh, some people there. You got fired by NW, NUNW, and with that dismissal came your disassociation with Swapo. Why does Swapo only become this ugly crea creature 
when things like that happen? I don't think that's a very accurate assessment, really, uh, or analogy. You see, within SWAPO, some of us tried take the, you know, the GIPF issue. We pushed that, but everywhere it was blocked within SWAPO, right? Wherever it may have made progress, you could tell it was just lip service being paid for this whole process, right? Um, but naturally so, because most of the people who were implicated or who, whose names were uh, listed in the reports, especially the one that was conducted by Namfisa itself, I mean, some of them were people very senior within, within SWAPO, you see. So, but in truth, when you try from within um, to do what you feel, feel is right and, and you don't progress, you, cannot, you don't get anywhere, then the only option for you is to begin to get out of it and uh, continue your fight. But the fight hasn't changed, it remains the same. Um, I still believe that if those who had hegemony within SWAPO were the rank and file, um, the situation would have been different. Some of us would not have left. But the hegemony of SWAPO lies in the hands of those who control capital, those who have very uh, sick relationships with the very same people that we, we are set out to fight, you see. So uh, that's one side. The other side is uh, there's so much that you see SWAPO does or omits to do that simply doesn't speak to the reasons why some of us had joined it. Let's deal with the issue of genocide, for instance. I don't know if you have ever had <laughs> SWAPO coming out saying they want to support um, the, the, the affected communities. It has never done that. Why not? Why not? Is it because of the tribes that are involved? Uh, they are not of any political significance to it? Or wh what exactly is the agenda? Yeah. And, and apart from SWAPO not coming out in support of the affected communities, you have a government that constantly tells you that for as long as it is here and in its, you know, in its government, there shall be no discussions about uh, ancestral land. Now, I mean, why? Hmm. What is wrong with discussing ancestral land? You've got, you see, one Namibia, one nation doesn't mean that we should simply just ignore the diversities of, of, of our population. We are diverse people, you know. The fact that we have tribes in this country doesn't mean that uh, it's, it's a bad thing and, 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 and when you say you, you must recognize the identities of these tribes, it doesn't make a person a tribalist. But when you begin to neglect or negate your responsibility towards these tribes under the rubric of one Namibia, one nation, then you are actually being di disingenuous. And I think Swapo has been disingenuous with its um, um, one and be a one nation uh, 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 mandra, you know, for want of a better word. Mm. You know, it has been disingenuous. You know, you cannot neglect, you cannot simply isolate or ostracize people and, and, and continue in their faces. Wherever you buy farms in areas that are in close proximity to the reservations of, of some of these groups, you bring, you bring people from far away, you, you plant them there, and you expect society to be okay. Yeah? That's not gonna work, you see. So mm -hmm. I think those reasons or those factors, together with many others, have pushed some of us, or forced some of us, to reconsider our association with SWAPO, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, and, and I feel that the SWAPO that some of us thought <laughs> we had joined, and the SWAPO that it is today, Two different things. Um, I'm sure others may disagree, others may agree. Um, we can deal with the issue of, of how Swapo, for instance, handled the issue of detainees. You know, in Lubango, uh, people in, 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 in Tanzania, in, in Zambia, uh, very own people, very own brothers and sisters who died, who perished, who were arbitrarily detained and killed. Yeah, but that history has always been there when you guys... Yeah, but you see, this, this, but, but the question is, 
it, until when do we ignore that? And, and, and I think I'm beginning to think also that perhaps one of the key reasons why Swapo is very allergic, if you will, or has this anathema towards dealing with this issue of, um, of, um, of, of genocide is also probably because it, it, it doesn't come to the table with clean hands, you know? So, and, and, and again, we may differ, we may agree, but there are certain things that we all learn as we move on. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and I think whether some of these things may have happened during the time that some of us were members of SWAP or not, it's inconsequential to the questions that continue to be asked today. And I think everybody and anybody in this country has every right to ask questions. And I feel the way that we have dealt with this thing is just not correct. Yeah. yeah. We go for a quick break and then return with uh, Ivelastos Karonda. Karonda. Now, Mr. Karonda, let's turn our attention to your new political party. It's uh, election year. Um, let's clear the ground first around your legitimacy as president of the party. <laughs> There's been uh, a lot of questions asked. Yes. There's a group uh, led by or part of the people in that group is Mr. Shikudu and others who continue to insist that you are not president of Swan. Right. Look, to insist is okay. I mean, it's within their eyes, I suppose. Um, 2022, Swanu had its um, Congress uh, held in Okahanja. The same Chikulus and others, they were there. Uh, Charles Kachivirwe, uh, the Mamberwas, they were there. Um, Congress concluded its business. Leadership was elected. Um, it so happens that that leadership, you, you know, has me as the president. Now, in all political parties, you always, you know, find people who have their own views. Um, but when those views, diverse as they, as they may be, are tested, and the highest decision-making organ of the party makes certain pronouncements, whether you like them or not, you must abide. You know, you, you swallow your pride, you abide by that, and you move forward. Now, I hear Jikudu calls himself a Secretary General of Swanu. Now, I know Political parties in this country are registered under the or by the Electoral Commission and the, under, of course, the Electoral Act. Now, the registration certificate of Swanu is one. It is one registration, you know, uh, number. It is one head office. It is one parliamentarian. Um, it has one Politburo. I appointed the Politburo. Uh, our parliamentarian is part of that Politburo. We operate from head office. I'm in charge there. So I don't know which Swanu uh, <laughs> my brother leads. And I don't know where he leads it from. We are in court, you know, with them. And the case is between Swanu as the plaintiff and they are the defendants. Now, which Swanu is in court and which Swanu is here Secretary General of when uh, he was taken to court by Swanu. Mm. So th there's no such, you see, um, 
it may take a while for people to accept that they are fighting a lost cause or a losing battle, but it is within their rights to do so, I suppose, until the court tells us otherwise. And that's why we, we, we took a decision to ask the court to assist us in yeah. this thing. Um, now, uh, I'm also aware that uh, uh, at ECN, you, every political party has what they call a representative. Yeah. That representative is a member of my Politburo. His name is Isi Chihoreko. So I don't know what it is that Mr. Chikulu and his group are talking about. Um, and it is something that, in my view, um, should actually no longer enjoy any attention. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost ludicrous, really, uh, for anybody <laughs> to suggest that there are two Swanus or, you know, there's, there's a leadership that Chikulu claims to be a sort of general of mm. when there's only one Swanu. Yeah. And uh, we will be contesting in the elections as Swanu under that very same registration certificate. So I don't know which one Chikulu will be coming uh, forth mm. with. Mm. Mm. Yes. The... <coughs> The party, yes, as oldest in the country as it is, and uh, also with a proud history, in fairness, it's uh, a liberation, a liberation movement on its in its own right. Um, has really, really become a small party in terms of numbers. You can't afford. These factions again, these court battles, this Shikudu group, you know, gunning for your, for your head ahead of a very, very important election in 2024. You see, I, I, I do agree with you, and I think I, I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, but sometimes, one needs to break new grounds if one is to grow. Um, there's something called um, constructive destruction. And I think, uh, and I'm borrowing from Joseph, you know, Schumpeter. Um, in, this, in this case, you, you cannot arrive at anything new without dismantling the all that has kept us um, to the ground. I mean, Chikulu, what is he? He's probably beyond 60, 70 years of age. He's been with Swanu all his life. Swanu has always had serious electoral misfortunes under their tutelage. So the question is, what are they hoping to do which is new, which they couldn't do for the past 30 odd years? You know? So, my take is simple. Um, with or without these comrades, we will move forward. Um, we will have to break new ground. And we will have to sell Swanu, as you said, as a political party that has a proud history. Um, and, and I think that time has come. We have, we've been doing it. People seem to be buying into what we are doing. Um, it's unfortunate that there is a faction like that, uh, but we, we cannot labor on that. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to move forward. Yeah, yes. yeah. So, with the new dispensation in charge of the party, does uh, the ideology also change? Maybe, maybe that electoral misfortune is linked to the ideology of the party. Maybe it's not appealing to many people. Do you maintain it? What is the ideology of the party? I think, look, Swanu's ideology is premised on the need to respect the dignity of all people and to promote that dignity in a way that would promote equal access of these very same people to economic opportunities or to all opportunities in life yeah. um, without regard to a person's social 
status or standing. The idea is to create a society in which all of us can have equal access to the kinds of services that every human being needs, every yeah. human being cannot do without. Um, so we don't believe in a society where class dictates what the individuals get in the end, you know. It's not about you having money flying to the United States to get treatment when your country has institutions that you're supposed to strengthen and provide people the very same treatment or quality of treatment. You see, we want to, to deal with that and kill that. So the, the philosophy of Swanoa, its, its ideology, in as far as I'm concerned, remains very relevant. But the, the question is, how do you package it so that it begins to resonate with your contemporary uh, voter? Um, that to me is the issue. I mean, look, for instance, at LPM. LPM was founded on the premise that it's about land. It's a landless people's movement. Swano has always been about land. But the way LPM had its campaign or message packaged was different and it was effective. It resonated with people and it got them um, four seats in parliament. So it's not so much the relevance or otherwise of the message. It's how you, it is presented, it's how it's packaged and how accessible it is to those that would actually go to the polls. Mm. Um, to rely on history as a former liberation you know, movement, it doesn't wash anymore, it, doesn't, it won't fly. Yeah. You know? um, and I think a lot of our people within leadership uh, of Swanum were also people who are not young. So they can't connect with um, the, 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 the young voting demography, um, and, and that's problematic. Um, the other one, of course, is when you look at how Swanu was structured, um, you would see already structurally that it was in no position to reach out to, for instance, the workers at the shop floor mm. and, and gain the workers' support or ear. Um, and in so doing, mobilize them to support the party's political program or political, um, you know, uh, success. Uh, so those are things that we have been trying to, to work on. Um, and, and, I, and I strongly feel with a little bit of, you know, of that more and more done uh, uh, between now and, and, and the elections, we, we could possibly see those fortunes reversed. I mean, misfortunes, you know, reversed. Um, so. That that is that is that is my take my take on that. Yeah. yeah. Do you think things like uh, rebranding the party, give it a, a new look, a new feel, like almost what PDM did? PDM, of course, uh, they rebranded, uh, and I I am not naive to think that uh, their increased presence in in parliament was due to that, mm. but um, it has given the party some sort of new identity from the DTA that a lot of people despised? Well, they, they needed that as, as a way of perhaps cleansing themselves of that uh, bad um, um, history that, that, that they have. Um, what Swan, however, needs to do is to just repackage its message. Um, and then begin to bring in new blood, younger people. Um, I think that, that, that to us is, 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 the, is, 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 is what is key um, um, is, or what is pivotal. Uh, to rebrand, um, may, maybe not yet, mm. maybe not now. We, we, you see, the, the history from where we also come, you know, is a history that unfortunately created in some people's minds that Swanu perhaps is a party that belongs to a particular tribe. Yes, um, I was going to come to that. And, but when, when you closely look at the history, you see one of the first fights that Swanu leadership had uh, at the very um, early ages of its formation was with the chief's council. 
And um, because of the differences that the leadership of, the, you know, of Swanu had with the chief's council, Swanu was ostracized by the chief council. And a lot of support through Kerina and, and, and the chief, uh, you know, um, started moving towards the creation or supporting the establishment of SWAPO, um, you know. And when, again, the leadership in SWAPO started having some problems also within, I mean, with, with the chief's council, then the chief's council had no choice but to now establish its own political party. That's how NUDO came about, I think, in 63 or 64. Now, if Swanu was a Herero party, it couldn't possibly then has, have escaped the, 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 the control or leadership of the chief's council. So that tells you again historically as a fact that Swanu was never created to be a party for a certain tribe. But it has become so now. Yes, it has become so or it was perceived or is being perceived as such. But again, I mean, look, look, look at, at the objective facts. Um, and, and I don't want to necessarily rely on those to make a point. But the point is that you've had leader, senior leaders of, of the party who don't necessarily come from uh, the you know, Chihiro speaking tribe. Um, I'm sure you had you know, Dr. Tangeni here yourself. Um, at the present moment, I'm the president, the vice president is, 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 is a Kwanyama lady. Um, so, and, and other comrades, whether Namas, Chwanas, and so on, they are still with, you know, in, in the leadership. So I think it, 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 it's, it's actually wrong or inaccurate to characterize Swanu as a Herero political party. Um, it's, you, it's far from that. Yeah. So, you know, I, I see this, um, <laughs> that argument a lot. You know, people thinking that because you have now thrown in some other Eth ethnicities within, yeah. within that space then. But the base of the party, the electoral base of the party, the way you draw your, because the numbers are there, which constituencies are the main, the mainstay of the party. Of course, we can argue like that for, with about almost every polit political party, but now we are talking about Swano here. Do you think, for example, that um, you have Nudo, you have Swano, you have PDM, those primarily three, drawing the majority of their base from the Herero speaking constituencies? Does it make the space even narrower for you to navigate your way through to Parliament and other places where you want to be. That's right. Look, but that's precisely what I meant when I said we need to break new grounds. You, you cannot use that as a base um, to reverse what I said, you know, what I referred to as electoral, you know, misfortunes. Mm. You can't do that. Mm. Um, and, and that's why it is important to have people uh, from other ethnic, you know, groups, if you will, uh, in top leadership. Yeah. so that with them you help the party to break new grounds. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, um, it so happens that, um, as, as you said earlier, that you know, quite a few of our political parties in the country appear to have a particular you know, strong um, leaning towards a given you know, tribal ethnic you know, group. Um, Swapo is, is, no, is no different, um, but again, that is perhaps um, history and that is, those are the demographics that we have. Um, but anybody who establishes a political movement or political party and draws particular support from a particular region, yeah. um, you can't really fault them. Yeah. Um, you can look, for instance, at LPM and say, well, predominantly it's, 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 it's a NAMA, uh, you know, party. But the question is, why did the NAMAs feel the need to do what they did um, and, 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 and join or form, you know, LPM? Uh, was it because they are tribalists? 
or was it because they were responding to the obtaining realities of the day? And I think in his case, um, the, the, the latter is true, that they were responding to those obtaining realities um, from which they couldn't escape. Mm -hmm. um, realities that, in my view, were brought um, forth by the way in which SWAPO handled itself and the government, mm -hmm. um, you know. Um, but it's true that as you want to move forward, you do not want a country that is fragmented along those lines because it becomes dangerous, yeah. you see. Yeah. But those are the realities that, that we all have to, to deal with. And fortunately or unfortunately, SWANU ever since you know, its inception um, has had to navigate those very same um, you know, realities. And to this day, um, we, we may be said to be drawing support from a particular you know, region or, or tribe of, of our country. But in truth, um, we always reach out. Yeah. Yes. The final question, uh, and very briefly, if you can summarize it for me. So, Swanu is likely to post you as its presidential candidate. Um, and as much as the party is not as big as it uh, ought to be with its history and everything, we have also seen instances of individuals like uh, Dr. Panduleni in 2019 as an individual really pushing above, above punching above his weight uh, to get the amount of votes that he got. Do you think uh, Karonda, the man that uh, had a revolutionary history within particularly the trade union uh, movement, has gained enough reputation to pull voters not only into the party, but also into him as himself as a candidate? Well, what I can tell you is that... Can you take on that more than that You should not discount Karonda, especially because of his history with uh, the labor movement. You should not discount Karonda because also of his history with the student movement. Um, people that I served with in the student movement, the people I led as students, are no longer young, they, they have long gained um, access to the e voting demography. So don't, don't discount that. But also, what is it that Memendaitwa offers that is different from what Itula offers? I don't see the two offering anything that is distinctly different from one another. Um, and then I think what you want is a person who will not only give hope to our people, but also who understands exactly what it is that needs to be done, you know. Um, and, and we cannot rely on the empty rhetorics that we've had for the past 30 odd years. Um, and again also, the, the question of, um, you know, Dr. Itula having pulled the crowd that, that he pulled, um, I remember a few months before that election, um, whether you go through the taxis or wherever you go, a lot of people thought, well, we need to support a guy like McHenry. McHenry was uh, also a likely, you know, candidate. But what happened? Why did people choose Itula more than they chose McHenry? Other than the fact that the majority of those who went to vote for Itula speak Oshuambo. See, again, the question of tribe comes in. Yeah. Not so much the agenda that Itula puts forward, because agenda, Itula doesn't put forward any different agenda from <laughs> what we have seen. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. time, time is up. But uh, so thank you, uh, Mr. Karonda. Good, my brother. Yeah, that's uh, maybe last is Karonda. He's uh, president of uh, SWANU, just uh, sharing with us uh, his perspectives. Thank you for watching.